The Scuba Diver Magazine podcast is sponsored by Scuba Pro, who are celebrating their 60th year of being an iconic scuba brand, and Scuba Pro has a few offers that I'm going to break down later on in this podcast. Hi, all of you wonderful scuba divers out there. Welcome to the Scuba Diver Magazine podcast. Uh, now, I'm going to make this one a little bit of a shorter podcast, I'm afraid, um, mainly well for two reasons. One, there was quite little news this week. It's been kind of a quiet news week, uh, but also I've got a bit of a cold, so I'm not really sure how long my voice is going to uh, is going to hold out. Um, so yeah, this one might be a little bit shorter. I don't know. It depends how interesting these news stories are. Um, the first one is that news that the very first interstellar materials have been found on Earth underwater. Um, they've found these like little marbles of meteorites from outside of our solar system, which is pretty cool. Um, and scientists have found that it was a chunk of ambergris with the value of £430,000 that killed a sperm whale in the Canary Islands. Uh, it seems that it got stuck in its digestive system and, uh, and that's what killed the underwater giant. So yeah, the first news story is pretty cool, and it's a deep ocean expedition has discovered the first known traces of a meteorite likely to have travelled from beyond our solar system, and it basically makes finding needles in haystacks look easy in comparison, because each fragment was not only, they, not only did they have to work out where they were likely to be on the planet Earth, if they were going to be here at all, but also they're like 1.7 kilometers underwater and they're only like a millimeter, if that, across. Uh, so this is a project run by uh, astrophysicist Avi Loeb and, and, the, and their team collected 50 tiny metallic spheres that have now been confirmed as unlike any alloys known to exist in our solar system, which is pretty cool. Um, to find these little alien fragments, which are known as spherules, um, so small spheres, from the Pacific Ocean, um, deep water off of Papua New Guinea, the Harvard University professor and Galileo Project founder deployed the world's first interstellar hook designed to attract the particles that form when meteorites or asteroids explode. And... The whole story started in October 2017 when the cigar shaped comet, uh, uh, Oumuamua, I'm going to say, it looked like a Hawaiian name. Um, it hit world headlines, you might remember it, uh, as it drifted past Earth. Loeb hailed it as the planet's first known interstellar visitor, and his analysis brought him a, uh, a best selling book and set him hunting for other spatial anomalies. And the nearest other solar system, which is Alpha Centauri, is 25 trillion miles away, and they're thinking that it's coming from there. And searching through data sets, he came across what came to be called Interstellar Meteor 1, or IM1, which was like a basketball-sized object that had exploded over the Pacific on the 9th of January 2014. It was too small to be noticed by telescopes, unless you're really looking in the right direction, and its arrival had um, generated a bright fireball that was recorded by US government sensors, so they kind of saw it, and they shared IM1's trajectory, the speed, the altitude, um, but withheld all other data in case it revealed too much about its tracking systems. So one thing that's interesting about this is that the scientists would expect interstellar meteorites to travel more rapidly than normal, because they got a long distance to travel, and the data showed that IM1 is about 95% faster than most others. And its content also appeared to be tougher than steel because it had not broken up in Earth's atmosphere but then reached the lower atmosphere and before like scattering and whatnot. So in mid-June, Professor Loeb mounted the Interstellar Expedition coordinated by Expedition Leader Robert McCallum um, and it was all like privately um, funded by US crypto on, uh, entrepreneur Charles Hoskinson and... Using the Papua New Guinea research ship, the Silver Star, as a platform, the team began their search 52 miles off Manus Island 
And after combining US military data with local seismic readings to calculate IM-1's landing place, they deployed the interstellar hook, which was towed behind it. It's like an underwater sled. And it collects samples of potential meteor debris using powerful magnets. And over two weeks, they covered more than 175 kilometers of search lines, just kind of um, almost dragnet fishing, but fishing for little it's, it's big scale magnet fishing like you see people do off of bridges um, but they found their first metallic pearl on the 21st of June and soon after they found that they started to find others they were in the right area and they were in the 0.1 to 1 millimeter size range so these are like tiny like shot you know the lead that you get in uh, in shot weight pouches is about that size they weigh under a milligram each and most were found along the meteorite's calculated path. So they knew that they were in the right area. And the team now appear to have become the first humans in history to knowingly handle interstellar material. And Professor Loeb says that we were able to collect submillimeter spherules from the bottom of the Pacific Ocean near the fireball coordinates of the first recognized interstellar meteor is a testimony to the success of the scientific method. Um, these spherules can also be byproducts of vehicle exhaust or brakes. You get that like brake dust, welding, uh, or volcanic activity. But the team's preliminary analysis of the composition of the spherules that they found has revealed that they do not match any commonly manufactured alloys or natural meteorals from our solar system. So they're thinking that it's coming from outside of our solar system, which is pretty cool. Um, they consist mainly of iron, uh, but with negligible nickel content, plus a few trace elements indicating a common source distinct from control spherules collected by the team outside the Papua New Guinea search area. Um, so yeah, I just thought it was pretty cool. And you never know, there might be plenty of this stuff down there, uh, even in shallower waters. But because it's only like a millimetre across, us scuba divers probably just glance over it all the time and just consider it like sand. Um, hey, uh, good news from, um, uh, from here in the UK. The first three highly protected marine areas, or HPMAs, uh, in England are now under the highest level of protection in our seas as their destinations come into, or sorry, designations come into effect as of the 5th of July. So this will help to protect some of our most precious marine species and habitats, such as honeycomb worm reefs, northern gannets and harbour porpoises, improving the health of our ocean for generation to come. As an independent coastal state, the HPMAs represent a huge leap forward in the UK government's ambitious marine conservation targets and commitments to protecting our blue planet set out in the Environmental Improvement Plan and the 25-Year Environment Plan. These MPAs have um, always been kind of contentious. Uh, if you followed myself and Sean for any length of time, you'll know that we, we don't really understand uh, marine protected areas because in a lot of cases you can still fish in marine protected areas, which seems antithetical. Like, well, hang on, how could you still fish in a protected area? But anyway, now we have highly protected marine areas. And a highly protected marine area is an area of the sea, including the shoreline, that allow the protection and full recovery of marine ecosystems by setting aside some areas of sea with high levels of protection. HPMAs will allow nature to fully recover uh, to a more natural state, allowing the ecosystem to thrive. So it sounds wonderful. Uh, HPMAs will protect all species and habitats and associated ecosystem processes within the site boundary, including including the seabed and the water column. And the three areas are Allenby Bay, uh, the northeast of Farns Deep. Uh, that's a, a pretty big one. That's 492 square kilometers, uh, which is pretty cool. And Dolphin Head. So these pilot HPMAs will be designated as marine conservation zones under the Marine and Coastals Act 2009 in line with advice from Natural England and the JNCC. It is anticipated that extractive, destructive and depositional activities, so whether you're 
taking something out, whether you're destroying something or whether you're putting something there, those kind of activities will be prohibited within each site. This would include activities such as commercial and recreational fishing, dredging, construction and anchoring, non-damaging levels of other activities to the extent permitted by international law are allowed, public authorities including the Marine Management Organization, the MMO, and inshore fisheries and conservation authorities will need to ensure they meet the general duties and specific duties in relation to certain decisions that may affect marine conservation zones within the M. Uh, the Marine and Coastal Access Act 2009. So, sounds like, yeah, as long as you're not taking anything out of the water, damaging anything in the water, or putting, just dumping things into the water, it's a protected area. So it sounds like we'll still be able to go scuba diving there, um, as long as you're not, like, dropping anchors, which could uh, disrupt the bottom. Um, but, yeah, to create these actual protected areas where you can't go fishing uh yeah it just sounds like a no-brainer and um there were a few others that um apart from those uh, those three that were shortlisted um but but didn't make it so as long as these three do well um then yeah hopefully they're going to start expanding and having more than just three um so yeah that's good news for uh, for waters especially around here in the uk and yeah the the final news story is that a, a sperm whale washed up on the um, on the canary islands and as usual with any of these big cetacean um beachings they kind of want to find out why and a veterinary pathologist and his team were called to determine the cause of death of the sperm whale, and they found the answer in a rare substance produced by the whale itself. So the whale was a 30 meter long male sperm whale, and it had been reported in May when it was found dead on La Palma's Nogales beach. But after attempts to tow the mammal to a port had failed, it was decided that a necropsy, um, which sounds a lot like a, an autopsy, should be carried out on site. Do it there and then. The results were reported only recently. After the team arrived, they did their initial inspection, just kind of checking it out from what they could see, and they assessed that the whale seemed a bit light for its size, so they suspected a gastrointestinal problem as if it had eaten something and it had a blockage and they were checking the whale's stomach when they found a large obstruction so yeah that made sense um they went on to remove this uh, obstruction and it turned out to be an unusually large lump of ambergris uh, which weighed about 10 kilograms and measured about 60 centimeters across so ambergris you may have heard of it before it's a highly valued material by perfumers for its sandalwood-like fragrance, but mainly because it contains an alcohol that acts as a fixative. So perfume, when you spray it on yourself, if it has ambergris in it, it lasts a lot longer. Um, but of course, it's a whale product, so you can only um, like buy and sell it in certain countries, so it's highly restricted. But it's incredibly valuable to the right buyer. And because of, it's like 10 kilos of this stuff, um, they they worked it out that if you were to sell it, it would be roughly 430,000 pounds worth at market rates. Now, ambergris is created within the digestive system of sperm whales. One theory is that the waxy secretion is formed by the bile duct to ease the passage of indigestible remains of cephalopods what, um, that the whales eat. Uh, so bits like the, the beaks of squid, cuttle bones, things like that is to help that kind of move it through the system. Uh, another is that it's composed of the indigestible remains themselves and it all just kind of like clumps together. But any ambergris formed in a whale is usually excreted eventually um, and it's sometimes found floating in the water. There was a news story, Struth, it was probably about a year ago now, where a poor fisherman, I forget where they were, I think it was Indonesia, found this kind of hunk of ambergris 
and yeah it was worth like hundreds of thousands so um yeah that was a very valuable find for that uh, for that poor fisherman that's why they call it floating gold but in this case the the lump inside of the whale had grown too big to be expelled naturally and had ruptured the whale's colon and that killed the whale as sepsis um, spread throughout its uh, its system so it's a kind of good news bad news situation um obviously bad news for the whale because the poor thing had to die um but good news that it kind of it wasn't our fault if that makes sense we're seeing a lot of whale beachings um with like a lot of naval procedures when they use certain sonars and things it just confuses the uh, a lot of nearby whales and they end up beaching themselves uh, but this one it just seems to unfortunately uh, died of natural causes is probably a, a nice way of putting it and the law in spain um would allow them to actually sell this valuable discovery and um and a possibility is that any sale would go towards the relief of victims of a volcanic eruption that destroyed hundreds of homes and businesses uh, on la palma two years ago um, so yeah, maybe that's going to have a, a positive outcome for the, for the local community, uh, having this, uh, this 10 kilo chunk of, um, of ambergris. So as I mentioned at the start, this podcast is sponsored by the scuba diving giant Scuba Pro, who have been making great scuba diving equipment since 1963. And Scuba Pro makes everything from masks and snorkels and fins to wetsuits, dry suits, dive computers. They have a beautiful range of regulators as well. And they have a great range of products that scuba divers love because... If you take their fins, for example, they still make their jet fins, which are a design from the 1960s, but divers still love them because they simply got it right the first time. The only upgrade that the jet fins have ever had over the years is to add spring heel straps. And Scuba Pro also makes some of the most cutting edge fins today from their Sea Wing Nova and Supernova fins. So Scuba Pro covers the entire range of diving equipment from their heritage equipment to modern technology. And right now Scuba Pro has a pair of offers at participating dealers. The first one is a free Octo offer. If you buy a Scuba Pro S620Ti or the D420 with either a Mark 19 Evo or the Mark 25 Evo first, stage you're going to get yourself a s270 octo for free which is a great way to start building a regulator set and start saving yourself some money the d420 may look a little bit different to some other second stages but it breathes beautifully the s620 is a combination of the best features of other scuba pro second stages in a great all-rounder of a second stage the free octo offer also extends to their s600 with a mark 25 or a mark 17 evo first stage which is one of their most popular regulators again a very strong all-rounder that and the g260 or the new g260 carbon black tech with either a mark 25 or a mark 19 evo first stage you'll get yourself a free r105 octo now i know that was a lot of numbers that i just threw at you but if you visit your local scuba pro dealer there's a dealer locator on the scuba pro website where you can find your nearest and they can help you find the right regulator for you the second offer is a dry suit promotion, which is a great way to save some money again or get a fancier dry suit combination in your budget. If you buy a Neoprene EverDry 4 or an Exo Dry dry suit, you can get a free K2 light undersuit set or a K2 medium thickness undersuit for £99, which has a suggested retail price of £298, so you're saving yourself some money. Or if you prefer a trilaminate dry suit, if you buy the Evertech Breathable or the Definition Dry, you will get the K2 Extreme undersuit for free, which is a great way to stay warmer in the water personally i tend to wear my dry suit year round here in the uk so a dry suit is a great investment both of these offers are running until the end of july in certain regions and participating dealers so do ask them first before you turn up demanding for free scuba pro equipment Otherwise, yeah, there wasn't a great deal of news this uh, this week. I did see one news story of a, um, a Mexican guy who tried to, I think, cross the Rio Grande and, uh, and sneak into the US using 
kind of cobbled together scuba gear. Um, I, I presume he wasn't diving particularly deep because he only had like a three litre cylinder on his back, um, if anything. And uh, yeah, just very makeshift scuba equipment. I mean, he was only diving in uh, like his, his blue jeans. So um, I think his, his idea was just to kind of sneak under the water. Uh, he was caught. Um, so um, yeah, didn't didn't work particularly well but yeah it just goes to the uh, the extent that some people will do to uh, to cross the border um but yeah it has been kind of a quiet week i've been mainly working on a um an article on photo editing apps um that was on um on diver net trying to turn that into a video and yeah some of them are pretty clever there's one that I'm not a huge um, like fan of because in their terms and conditions, uh, they basically have the rights to use your photograph uh, if you use their system, which, yeah, I'm not a huge fan of. Um, and also for the free version, uh, it's it automatically puts their watermark on your photo. So, yeah. But others are, are pretty good. And... Talking with uh, with a few underwater photographers, the general consensus is like Adobe Lightroom is just the the daddy, and uh, and I've used it myself. Very powerful. Um, it's not the cheapest, but it's one of those things you get what you pay for, um, especially with Adobe, and very easy to use and very easy to control, and you have lots of different controls. Um, but yeah, it just breaks down five of the um, uh, of the apps out there that you can just edit your photos and some of them your videos as well which is pretty cool and um yeah that's probably going to be a few weeks away um because I've, I've caught up with myself and i've uh, i've managed to produce a few more videos um running forwards but um but yeah that's what i've been mainly working on this week and trying to catch up with uh, with ask mark again um but yeah if uh, if this cold continues that's um that's going to be a real pain in my side because um as much as i can record it's quite hard to um to edit out any coughs and splutters and whatnot so uh, so i'm hoping this is just going to be a 48 hour bug and uh, and then everything's back to normal but yeah i kind of need my voice and uh, and you can probably hear that i'm a little bit croaky didn't have the best of nights last night um but with pharmaceutical help and uh, and caffeine it seems to be doing okay, um, but yeah, I'm I'm glad that I'm not uh, like going going in the water anytime soon because uh, I just feel continually knackered. Um, it is quite easy to um, uh, to write scripts and edit videos, but yeah, to be able to um, uh, to go underwater, ugh, I'd be knackered. Um, picked up my uh, my twin set and uh, and a stage cylinder from uh, from service so they're all good i'm ready to go back into the water but yeah i just need to shift this um oh yeah it's always fun when you go uh, sort of back into the dive center and uh, and catch up with the uh, uh, with the guys and girls there make sure that everything's okay make sure that my equipment's okay um I think my regulators are good for a little bit they'll need a yeah, a service before long but um but yeah, hopefully I'll be able to get them wet as soon as possible, as soon as I can just shift this um, bug, whatever I've picked up. Um, but yeah, um, thank you for listening, everybody. I think I've made it a, a decent 20 minute um, podcast, at least. Um, yeah, if you do have any new stories, by all means, pop them down in the uh, in the description below. Uh, links are always, um, uh, always welcomed. It makes my life a lot easier. Um, but yeah, I had a good look around this morning and yesterday afternoon, kind of looking for any other news stories that piqued my, uh, that could pique my interest. But yeah, it's a pretty quiet week. I'm not really sure why. Maybe it's just that um, like mid-season, no one's doing anything overly outstanding. I did see um, Fourth Elements are working with the um, uh, Tamlom cave system. They're revisiting the uh, the cave system where the uh, the thirteen boys and uh, oh sorry t was it 12 boys and they were uh, and their football coach where they were trapped in the cave system um so that's that's another story that you can follow uh if you head over to their um um i think i first saw it on their instagram page and there's a link they're doing a a, a multi-part series where they were um, uh, revisiting the uh, the cave system um 
but yeah that's uh, that's it for this week uh, yeah thank you for listening everybody uh, remember to uh, to head over to our website check out today's sponsor which is scubapro.com um, they've got a few deals on at the moment for regulators and dry suits uh, yeah thank you for listening everyone and of course safe diving the Scuba Diver Magazine podcast is sponsored by Scuba Pro. For more information, head over to scubapro.johnsonoutdoors.com and find out more about their amazing scuba diving range.